Anthony, thank you very much. And uh, Nicholas, thank you. Um, hugely grateful to be here and what a privilege. Martha, congratulations, first of all. Oh, well, thank you for being here. And it's great really to be for here. Coming all the way from London to, <laughs> to join this event. So that's wonderful. I've missed it for the world. Um, I'm, I'm going to jump right in and. Um, and ask you about somebody that you admire, Cicero, the Roman statesman. And I want to ask you about Cicero because I sense that one of the reasons you've been given this prize is because you have worked and fashioned yourself as a public intellectual. Mm -hmm. And Cicero spoke very movingly uh, about the need for not just the need, the duty, the civic duty of philosophy in the public realm. Why is that something that resonates with you? Well, of course, I'm not a politician as Cicero was, and I, I couldn't be. That's not among my, that's not in my skill set, I'm afraid. Um, but I do... More's the pity. I, I, well, <laughs> no, you know, I'm too thin-skinned, and well, anyway, I just, it wouldn't work. But Cicero had great... Um, courage in the political realm, but he also thought, and he told his son in this very moving part that he, he wrote to him, that he ought to go study philosophy before he entered public life because philosophy has a role to play in showing citizens something about what they should be doing. And I think what he, he thought was particularly, you learn to think well about justice, about what your duties are as a good person in this life, and you learn it in a kind of liberal education that he fostered and that he really believed in. And so I, I do believe that that's true, that I think all undergraduates should be studying some philosophy. But then, of course, some of us uh, have the opportunity, and, and then I think if we have the opportunity, maybe we also have the duty to, to write in the public realm and to try to influence the way policy is done in, in some manner. It's, it's very hard have, with the decline in print journalism, and it's very hard to figure out where you write and so on. But anyway, I think some of us, uh, if we can do it, we, we should. And John Rawls once took me to lunch at Bartley's Burger Cottage, I, I must say, it, in Cambridge. And uh, I, I was thinking of writing a review for the New York Review of Books, and I said, look, should I do it? It doesn't seem like the sort of thing the profession thinks well of. He said, well, he said, I can't do that. But if you can do it, then you have a duty to do it. So I really listened to that, and I, I've tried very hard to do that. Yeah. I, I've been a journalist for nearly 30 years and have worked in, in different parts of, of the world, and, and it's quite clear, not just to somebody who's been a journalist, but to everybody, that we are living in a unique moment in terms of political movements, in terms of uh, the rise of, of populism, not least in this country and, and, and of course in the country that I've made my home in for, for many years, the United Kingdom, mm. facing real challenges yeah. um, in terms of polarization of ideas. And, and, and I wonder why and what is it about philosophy that allows us to turn to that discipline that will help us understand shifts in political movements? Well, I think you first learn how to do something, which is crucial if there's going to be a deliberative public culture. Like when undergraduates take a first philosophy course, usually they've been brought up on a diet of talk radio where you just shout louder and interrupt people and talk louder and louder. And uh, you think the opponent is like a, a sports team you want to humiliate. Well, I love sports, but that's another matter. But, uh, but I do think when you're talking to people about politics, you have to learn, first of all, to listen to the structure of what their argument actually is. And this is what Socrates brought to the Athenian democracy, where people were just boasting and flinging out whatever claim they wanted to make. He says, no, slow down, lay out the argument. What are the premises? Do the conclusions follow from the premises? And then when you do that, you may actually understand yourself better. And as Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. But also, you learn a new attitude to people who disagree with you. Now it's not like, oh, they're the bad team. It's like, well, we differ at premise number two, but we might agree with premise number one. And then we have to try to figure out wh where the differences really kick in. And, and I see this every day when I teach 
undergraduates, but also law students and graduate students, you know, it makes a difference to your whole attitude to citizenship. How does that work in practice when we're living in an atmosphere where tribalism seems to prevail? Exactly the, the, the picture yeah. that you're painting, where people are unwilling to listen to the other side the opposing view, if you like. When you're talking about philosophy, the, the need for engagement and respectfully listening yeah, to yeah. the other is critical, right? Yes. Well, you know, for me, going on the lecture circuit, unfortunately, I end up uh, exchanging ideas with people who are already ready to listen. Uh, it's very difficult to have, to attract an audience of people who just think, oh, you know, liberal Nussbaum, and they don't want to listen to me. Um, <laughs> Occasionally, members of my own family will listen to me for a little while, but anyway. Um, well, but you mentioned family, so let, let me take you back to your, your own childhood. And, and I am really interested in the extent to which your, your father's relationship with you informed the kind of philosopher that you have become. <laughs> yeah. He clearly doted on you, you adored each other, but he was also a man of his time, born in 1901. He was sexist, he was anti-Semitic, he was racist. Actually, and not sexist, interestingly oh, enough. Really? He always okay. said to me, his law Excellent. firm... His law firm... <laughs> Redeeming need, features. No, his law firm <laughs> needed more women. No, but that was important because he really did encourage my high aspirations. And, but um, no, he Didn't grew necessarily up, want he them grew for your up mother. in the deep south. <laughs> And he was a racist of the sort that was characteristic of the early 20th century in the Deep South, but we were living in the North. Um, you know, we had fierce arguments, but he was also a man of reason. And so what I saw was this discrepancy between this extremely educated and successful lawyer who was a believer in reason and science and so on, and then these primitive attitudes about race, which were ridiculous. And so, of course, we had ferocious arguments about race, about Judaism, and so forth. Um, but it was, uh, it was something that it taught me something about the need to, un to dig deeper and understand people's emotions. I think a lot of the work I've done subsequently on disgust and stigma has come out of that experience. People don't, I mean, they're, they're, their emotions are not irrational if that means they don't contain thought, but they contain thoughts of a very peculiar, rigid sort. And if you grow up with them and they become habitual in you, then yes, people, who are perfectly reasonable in other areas will actually believe that if they drink from a glass that an African-American has drunk from, they will be contaminated in some way. So I've tried to understand that emotion all my career about how it figures in discrimination against gays and lesbians, against uh, even people who are aging. More recently, I've been working on the role of disgust in age discrimination, which I think is very, very large. Well, but before we get on to talking about the detail of that, let, let's just talk about how you framed it for yourself in, in the academic world. So one of the things that you tried to do and successfully achieved was to, to, to resurrect um, the Stoic theory, that there is a, 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 a definite, that, that there isn't a division between thought and feeling. And, and, and that seems, what you've built on is the importance of emotion in yeah. not just the personal sphere, but more importantly, in the public and the political sphere. Just, just reflect, if you would, sure. a little bit on, on, on that for us. Well, it was something that it was easy to come up with if you studied the history of philosophy, which I think everyone should do a lot more than happens sometimes today, because it's, it wasn't just uh, the Stoics, but really everyone in the ancient Greek and Roman world understood that emotions uh, involve intelligent appraisals of what's good and bad for your well-being, so fear involves the thought that something powerful and bad is out there and you're not fully empowered to ward it off, Disgust, well, they didn't talk about disgust so much, but I'll talk about anger. Anger involves the thought that some, something wrong has been done to someone or something that you care about, and that it would be a good thing for the wrongdoer to be punished somehow. 
So they all involve these thoughts that pertain to our own well-being. Now, I think even uh, most animals have such thoughts. They're not necessarily verbalized, but most psychologists who work on animals now do think, you know, of course they have fear, and of course they have many other emotions. So uh, anyway, it was uh, not just one ancient thinker, but it was the whole bunch, really. I focused on the Stoics because I, they wrote more about this topic than some of the others. But more recently, it was just the heyday of behaviorism that had made that kind of view disappear from psychology, but also from philosophy. And uh, really, it fell of its own weight because the behaviorist program that said that just stimulus and response are the only things you need to explain both human and animal behavior, but the, the insides of the creature, its own view of the world, were not important. It just didn't work. And Richard Lazarus, a very great psychologist, said, well, now we're thrown back to where Aristotle was when he wrote the rhetoric. And I think that was about, that was about right, but there were along the way some very courageous uh, psychologists and indeed neuroscientists. Anthony Damasio is one among them, I and mean, he's here tonight, who um, understood this about emotions, that their, they, their, their evolutionary role is to steer us around the world, help us make decisions by, as it were, mapping our good or ill in the world. So I just wanted to take the, the bare bones of the view that survived from the ancient Greek and Roman thinkers and then turn it into a more workable contemporary theory. And to do that, I had to do things that they didn't think of doing, like studying cultural differences in emotion, but also, particularly important to me, studying um, the childhood development, studying how infants are born with inchoate emotions of fear and sense of helplessness. And of course, in my, my new book, The Monarchy of Fear, I use a lot of that in explaining how we get into some of the political difficulties that we're in right now. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that then, because it, it, it's clearly something that is on the minds of, of, of those people who oppose uh, what's currently happening, as, as well as those who are in support of it. And, and I wonder if you, you would say something, not necessarily just in the context of the monarchy of fear, which, which you, in, in which you don't, you know, we don't hear, you don't write about Trump in the book that much. You, you refer to him a little bit in the context of the sexist language yeah. that he uses and the misogyny that, that he has uh, projected and, and has normalized in, in some respects. I, I, I wonder though, if you would talk a little bit about the impulse of writing about the current moment that we're living in and why you feel it's important that in order for us to understand it, we need to go back a little bit more. We need to look at history. Well, I started thinking about this right after the election. As I write in the book, I was in Kyoto for the Kyoto Prize. So therefore, I was all alone. I had no friends to talk to, you know. So I, all I could do was just sit there and think and, and in a way tremble for the country and its deep divisions. But I noticed that my own fear was a kind of panic and it was not itself very uh, admirable. And so I started thinking about that. And I guess what I came to the conclusion uh, Rocio, that, that my earlier work on emotions had been too piecemeal. I had taken disgust in one book, anger in another book, and compassion in another book. But I wanted now to see the causal relations among the different emotions, how fear, which I think is in evolutionary terms the most primitive, but also in chronological terms the first, it's behind everything. Maybe this was influenced by the fact that I was teaching a class on Lucretius, who does say some of these things. So I, you know, I always learn from the Greeks and Romans uh, in their sort of simmering around in my brain. But anyway, I do think it's true that when we are born, it's a place of agonizing fear in some respects. And then comfort comes, but we can't govern it. It comes, then it goes away again, and then we have to yell and scream and make it come back again. You know, so two things happen that pertain to the title monarchy of fear. We, we learn to run for comfort, or not run because we can't really move uh, for such a long time, but we uh, seek comfort from an omnipotent power source, 
when we're frightened. But second, we learn to behave monarchically ourselves, yelling and enforcing our will. Freud called the baby, his majesty the baby. And that I think is really true. I, 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 my, my own daughter was not monarchical. She was a re remarkably um, reciprocal child, but in any case, uh, babies are, are not usually like that. Well, I mean, it, it, when, you, when you try and, um, when you map what you're talking about in terms of psychoanalysis um, onto the political landscape that we're living with, I, I, I wonder what you would say to those people who are doing the shouting on yeah. both sides? Well, I think, you know, first take a look at what's really happening. Because I think, you know, the infantile experience of helplessness arises again many times in life. And I think the fear of death makes it all worse. And so periodically, this fear that's always simmering underneath rises up. And I think you should ask yourself, why is this a time of particular fear? What are we afraid of? What are the real problems? And I think there are a lot of real problems. The growth in automation, which is displacing most of the jobs that people in lower middle class uh, construction work and other sorts of jobs used to do. And all of a sudden, their social status, which used to depend on this sort of work, has gone and the jobs that do exist, and there are plenty of jobs, require university education, which is very, here in this country, it's too expensive for most people. So there are lots of problems, and we need to put our heads together to solve them. But I think what happens when people feel helpless is they latch on to something that makes them feel very comfortable, and then, too often, the fear can be projected outward onto some scapegoat, and they'll say, well, of course, we can't solve the problem of automation, so let's not think about that. Let's think of this immigrant group that's causing lots of disruption. And, and maybe they're not actually the problem at all, but it comforts people to think that some group that they might be prejudiced against anyway is the source of the problem. And I think that kind of scapegoating is encouraged by the stories we tell our children, unfortunately. You know, Hansel and Gretel go into the woods hungry children in search of food. The real problem in that story is hunger and the fact that the parents are working at menial jobs, they can't take care of the children. But the story tells you, oh no, those are not the real problems at all. The real problem is a witch who lives in the woods and she turns little children into gingerbread. The minute that you put that witch into the oven, the problems are solved and the world is just fine. So, you know, we do think like that and we learn to think like that through stories of that sort. And, and so we have to grow up and stop thinking in that fairy tale way. There are no easy fixes for big social problems. And but how, think, how, does that, how does that happen? How does that, that shift in a mindset take place? Because after you stop yeah. trembling in Kyoto with right, anxiety right, right. about the result of the 2016 election, you made a conscious decision to just try and engage. Yeah, and, yeah. and the engagement is the thing that, that really feels like it requires exploration for people on both sides. Well, I think it's lucky for me that I learned to associate thinking and engaging with joy and fun. And I'll tell you, that was my father again, because he used to, you know, we used to argue about this and that, but he would take me shopping and get some fantastic outfit, you know, because he had a lot of interest in fashion. And, and so I associate, you know, buying a pink suit with arguing and engagement. And it's really, you know, I have a lot of fun doing what I do. But I think for people that I teach and people that I know, I, I guess I think everyone has their own way to engagement. It doesn't have to be through writing books or articles, but people who work for a political candidate, people who go to a church group that's working for poverty on the south side of Chicago, people in my own synagogue who have a food garden that brings fresh produce to the poor. There's thousands of ways of engagement. I actually think one of the most powerful modes of engagement in any society is through the arts and just participating in the arts as either audience or performer, you, you learn a kind of emotionally rich and deep reciprocal engagement with others that's non-hierarchical. 
I was a professional actress for a while, and I know there are lots of problems in that profession and so on. But it, it's the, the, the artwork itself does cultivate your emotional knowledge, and it also gives you a sense that you can relate to people on a plane that's not that of yelling and denouncing and, and so on. So I think there are just so many ways. And the Chicago Children's Choir I support because it does bring together kids from 80% are below the poverty line and they learn to sing together. So that's another mode of engagement. And I guess I think that just everyone can sit and think, what, what is my best route to engaging with my society and making it a better one? And maybe it's very much by having children and bringing them up to be good citizens. I think that's one of the most important things that people But can even do. if you do that, if even if you successfully are able to bring up children who are active, engaged citizens, if you are then in the context of, say, a university, and, and that is your professional context, and you have students who hate Trump supporters, and Trump supporters yeah. hate the liberal elite students, what do you do? Where is the space where they can at least, you know, if, if they were a Venn diagram, where would the, the bit in the middle match? Where would they be able to meet safely? It is getting harder. And I think a lot of it is that a lot of the undergraduate schools, not ours so much, I think ours has maintained a sense of that civility is a, a crucial virtue, but that given civility, any point of view may be expressed. We have a free speech statement that my colleague Jeff Stone crafted that is excellent and we really stick to it. But uh, since our students are some, some of them law students and graduate students, they come from other schools where they haven't had that kind of open space and therefore they don't want to have it. They want to defend themselves. And so we're trying in, in the law school, we've talked about this a lot and I have to say that Part of this uh, prize is going to go to underwrite a program that we've just started of having lunchtime engagements where people, students with different po political positions will get together and talk about a problem. Be the reason being that they don't take courses from people they don't think they agree with, but they might go to lunch with them. Okay, and, and really, I mean, I, and I often do it with a conservative colleague, a wonderful guy named Will, Will Bode, and we, we just had one about gay rights and the bakery cases, and we had a wonderful time because the students really, if you set the right tone of res mutual respect and civility, and the students come there and they know it's only 90 minutes, they don't have to really give up their whole... <laughs> semester to, to liberal Nussbaum, um, then they really will, they, they do <laughs> Is that talk. what they call you, liberal Nussbaum? Well, I mean, I'm sure they call me many more unpleasant things than that. <laughs> but, but the truth is, they don't sign up for my class if they don't think they're basically agreeing with me, and that is the problem. Yeah. And uh, it used to be, another, I have another conservative colleague who, when he was a law student, took my class in feminist philosophy. I think he did it because his fiancée asked him to do it, but never mind. You know, he really was open-minded, he learned, and right now he's a very valuable colleague, he really is open-minded. So I, I really think that that's not happening as much as it did. When, when you, you strike me as, uh, in, in, in much of what you write, as a hopeful person, yeah. and, and I, I wonder what hope you have in the context of the prevailing mood of misogyny that exists. And, and, and I, I think I'm asking about that specifically because mm -hmm. it's the normalcy of it, the normalizing of it has mm -hmm. been set clearly by the way in which President Trump speaks on a daily basis. And one of the things that you say in the monarchy of fear is, is the surprising thing is that, that you can understand that appealing to his base, about which we know a great deal now, but the widespread embracing of normalizing that kind of language. And, and, and that feels as though it's harder to find hope in, in that. Well, I guess I think anyone who's a feminist, it would be surprising if they were not optimistic, because if you just look at the sheer data of how women have done around the world, starting with 
you know, women not being able to vote except in one country before the turn of the 20th century, you know, and now even in Saudi Arabia there's a nominal vote for women. So there's tremendous progress and even progress on the front of life and health, although that's more sticky. But in tertiary education especially, Everywhere in the world, women are now actually outperforming men. And it's not just in Europe and North America, but in all the Arab states, women outnumber men as uh, university students on the basis of competitive examinations. So look, I think there's great progress, but there are several things. So the two practical issues that I've been most concerned with in my career have been the equality of women and the equality of gays and lesbians. And that latter one, has shot ahead. And now I think it's fair to say that people under 35 just have completely different attitudes, at least in the United States. And I think in most, most countries, look, even in India, where there was a, a sticky period, but by now it's just broken open with the Supreme Court case. So, um, and what is the reason why it's more sticky with the relationship between women and men? Well, I think there are several things. One is that men feel displaced. The promise used to be, oh, if you let women into Yale or Princeton, never mind, the same number of men will still get in. And of course that was a lie. It couldn't possibly sustain itself for more than a few years. So men are going to lose out, and they are losing out. Look, they're, they're just not getting into... Uh, there's a lot of affirmative action for men in most universities in the United States because frankly, because of athletics in, in many cases, because Title IX requires a proportional expenditure on male and female sports, mirroring the proportions of men and women in the student body. So if you want your football program to be strong, you've got to beef up the number of men in your student body, even if the, uh, by straight merit scores they wouldn't get in. So anyway, men do feel threatened and they feel displaced. Yeah, so the progress that you're talking about is a provocation in and of itself yeah, for many it people. Is, it is a provocation. And the other thing is that unlike the equality of gays and lesbians, which basically doesn't require straight people to change very much, if you have a gay couple next door, well, you like them or you don't like them, but you don't have to say anything to them if you don't want to. You don't have to change when you realize that they're gay and lesbian. And it's not that way with women and men if they're living together. If they're living together, you know, the equality of women means that men are going to be doing more domestic labor, more childcare, and importantly, more elder care, which is not particularly pleasant for anyone to do, and it used to be thought Oh, women will just do that out of love. Well, okay, so these demands for change are very threatening. And I think, you know, for the most part, men are really going along with that and learning a lot. And the men that I teach are, are amazing. But, of course, there, are, there is a backlash, and we see that. And I, so I don't think that it's like that's the main issue of, on the Republican Party, but I do think it's an issue. And I think it's an issue that's really about something else. It's about a kind of feeling of threat. The woman used to be the one who buoyed you up when you were down. It was the place that received you at the end of a hard day. I'm teaching now some plays of Arthur Miller and even that left-wing playwright. All the women in his plays are homemakers and they're the force for strength in the house and they, when the man is suffering, they console the man. Women are not doing that anymore. They're having their own lives, and it's very confusing to people, and they want to punish the ones who are doing that. You know, uh, just smack them down, because it's scary to not have that source of comfort and support. Let, let, let's talk about leadership. Um, I, I, I'm interested in the, the comparisons between President Emmanuel Macron of France and uh, President Trump in the context of reading. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, not least because yeah, President yeah, yeah. Macron is in the news an awful lot yeah. um, this past few weeks. Um, the challenge to his own presidency is profound. Um, he is a philosophy graduate. Right, right. And he is a man who we think thinks very deeply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and he has clearly made some pretty big concessions. President Trump, on the other hand, we also know is not a big reader. Um, and and I, I wonder in that context, given that President Macron has gone some way to doing the thing that you think is really important in the political sphere, which is to listen, uh, mm. and clearly for many people he's made lots of mistakes, but he has listened and he's made big concessions. I wonder if you were in a room with President Trump how you would try and persuade him to occupy a different space to the one that he does? Oh, well, gosh. Um, I think, you know, he didn't even choose to go to the Jefferson lecture. I don't think he would have an interest in being in a room with me or in engaging with I mean, you can't engage with somebody if they don't want to engage with you. And this whole game that we always play in philosophy, which great philosopher of the past would you like to meet? Well, most of them wouldn't be willing to meet me and, and talk to me. So John Stuart Mill is the only one, right, who, who really would meet a woman on a plane of equality. Um, but no, I mean, look, I, I think Macron has great, I, I, I think well of him as a, as a politician, but I think he also has admirable use of the French language. It's really a pleasure. Whenever I'm in France and I need a tutorial, I try to listen to his speeches because it's such a beautiful, clear use of the language. But I don't really think that's the main thing in Nepal. I mean, what I'm looking for is depth of emotional understanding, depth of historical understanding, uh, which needn't be elite culture. I think we've had some presidents who laid claim to elite culture who were not particularly good presidents, and I think we've had some others, like, I mean, Lincoln was not, I mean, he educated himself, but look, he wasn't uh, Macron at all. He was a very, uh, people thought his speeches were very bad because they were so simple and so on. But, so there can be greatness in, in, in a different garb, and uh, so I'm not looking for the veneer of high culture, I'm looking for, emotional understanding. And I, I guess what I think is we should seek out politicians who have that, who are capable of communicating a historically informed and em emotionally rich vision of human beings and human vulnerability in a time of change. And then we should support them as much as we could. And I mean, I worked at, at a local level for Lauren Underwood, who's a new congresswoman from suburban Chicago. She's a nurse. She really understands people and their suffering. And she can talk about health care and the need for that. So of course, that's her one issue. She's not yet a national wide ranging politician. But I think you need people who can really engage with the human substance of the issue in the way that she does. And she's not, you know, fancy um, French philosopher, but, but, but that, so, so it's not, so uh, you see what I'm saying. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wonder though, if you, you know, you say that you can't engage with somebody who doesn't want to engage. You could argue that the division and the polarization that exists, not just in this country, but in any of those countries where we've seen voting patterns where people have chosen extremes. I, how, how, how is it possible to find a way of changing the public discourse? Because yeah. what tends to happen is that the press then mirrors the polarizing uh, effect that we're seeing. Right. The internet amplifies it and so on. The internet is a problem because it does make it possible to live all your life just reading only the stuff that you already agree with. And then that magnifies the effect of that. Uh, so a, a kind of polarization, group polarization effect that psychologists have studied. So I think it, we really need people like you and the BBC World Service. It's very hard in the US to get any good world news. I have to say, I mean, you get this steady diet of Trump, Trump, Trump all the time. And if you want to find out what's happening in Britain or France, you have to read the fine print under the picture and so on. So yeah, it, it's not good. But I do feel that, like each of us in our own spheres, there's something that we can do. Now, one of the, what I do is as a teacher, and I try to find these ways with my colleagues of getting students to engage with one another. And of course, I think that changes the legal profession. But there are other um, groups, like uh, there's a public affairs roundtable that one of our major law firms started to get people 
in, who are lawyers talking together. And now you would think lawyers would be highly rational and they would already be doing that, but you'd be surprised. There are some pretty um, polarized lawyers in Chicago as well. So that was, you know, I, I had a very good time at that round table because I could see that people who are very adept professionals can also have a, a curiosity to expand their way of engaging with ideas. But as I say, there are a hundred spheres, and the sphere of the arts is another one, the sphere of religion is another one. I think in each area, I mean, in my synagogue, we have this program called Words and Music, where we get people together and we have some music and some words. Usually the cantor will sing stuff and I or someone else will talk about the, the supply the words. And, um, you know, it's to approach people's minds through many different avenues and get them thinking together in a richer way. So I guess I think each, it's not like one size fits all, but it's that each person in their own community should think, well, what, what could I do to improve the political climate? There are book clubs, discussion groups of hundreds of different kinds that people have, and I think they do have a big impact ultimately on politics, but politics bubbles up from the local. And so we have to, I think, first approach these problems on a local level, especially because the United States is such a uh, federal and, and heterogeneous nation. I, I, I wonder, I mean, I, I, I'm a huge believer in the ripple effect of, of culture and, and mm -hmm. the people in this room are all people who are interested in ideas. It's, it's partly why you're here. And, and I wonder whether the one thing that each of us could do if you are new to Martha's work, buy her books. If you are interested in what she's had to say, buy her books for five other people. And, and <laughs> I, think, I think that way is, is, is something that somebody who isn't in that world, who isn't a teacher, who isn't necessarily involved in, in civic engagement, that the ripple effect of just talking about these things can somehow yeah. make a real impact. Well, I like that idea, and the one book that I wrote that did have that kind of wide, um, you know, ripple effect, I think, was the one about liberal arts education, not-for-profit, yeah. which has uh, been widely translated. But I thought, okay, I'm going to write this book because that book will go out and it will be in places where I'm not. But then I kept finding that I would be invited because, oh, we want our trustees to hear this message and we know they won't read the books, but if you come <laughs> and you give a lecture, then they might actually hear the lecture. So I had to stop doing that after a while because I didn't want to <laughs> repeat the same message. I felt like I was a little Star Salvation Army girl ringing my bell for the humanities. <laughs> and I wanted to do new work, you know? But I do think, sure, I mean, books can have a ripple effect. I wish we had more of a common culture of books. There are other countries. The Netherlands is one, and I think um, Colombia in Latin America is another, where there's a very rich culture of reading, where at the drop of a hat, you could get 500 people to come to have a discussion. And, and I, I mean, I don't know anyone in Colombia, and I just went there for three days, and all of a sudden, leading politician, the governor of the province of Antioquia, had a public debate with me about reconciliation after the drug wars and so on. And 500 people bought tickets for, and I thought, well, this is a sign of a very healthy public culture, whatever the other problems are. Why don't we have that in the United States? And I think it's probably just the sheer size of the nation. that You just can't get people together around one set of ideas. But whatever the issues are, I think we need to work harder to get a public culture of ideas. And whatever the news media can do in that respect would be most welcome. And because I think voices like yours are the, the crucial thing to circulate ideas to people who otherwise didn't know about books. Martha Nussbaum, thank you very much indeed for speaking to Well, us. thank you very much. Thank you, thank you.